Never much of a Bucks Ass fan, I have to say. Never never got into it. No. It wasn't for me. No, me neither. It's more it's more of a more of a Galway thing, is it? <laughs> it definitely certainly any of the people that I knew had all come from that uh that college experience. I think on your induction day in NUIG, you get to hand it a bottle of Buckfast. I think just that's just like welcome to welcome to the West. Little one. This is breakfast. This is breakfast every day for the rest of your life. Okay, I I, I, I don't like it, but uh, each to their own. It's just not nice. No, no. I ha- People mix it with stuff. I think I'm, I actually just don't. I presume not. I presume it's like just a handy way to if you're in a hurry, it's a handy way to to get up and running, but. Uh, other than that I can't really see the point of it sweet wine with a bit more alcohol in it is that it? am I right in saying that? syrupy wine with a bit more alcohol in it? Uh, is, that, syrupy, is that the top line on Buckfest? syrupy which maybe we should have a, a tasting session some morning here yes we should we, myself and Adrian were saying that we should do wine and cheese session on Friday morning you're more than welcome to join <laughs> no thanks That's, you know, I've got, a, sounds, I've got so, a radio show to do like on Friday evenings it? no it doesn't sound terrible uh, but well, yeah okay okay. Some, some, someday we'll do it it's 10 minutes past 9 this morning OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day I'm delighted to say to inject some uh, sanity into proceedings Graham Hunter is with us this morning Graham, good morning General Guarantees what what has taken you to be colic eclectic fellows onto an extended discussion of Buckfast and, and by by the way may I say when I arrived in Glasgow in the 80s red for fighting white for dancing just in case you wanted to know so explain the red for fighting. Are there multiple types of buck fast or do you mix it with something? <laughs> you pop down a little bit of red buck fast and you're ready to fight. You pop down a little bit of white buck fast and you're ready to dance. It's, it's not complicated, Jack. It was, there was an old firm connection. Pat Nevin was talking about uh, the alleged number of bottles of buck fast which had been collected after the old firm and we were like, well, I actually never tried it. So... You, um, you, you're off the hook. Well there you go. <laughs> there you That's go. the bucky reference. Okay. There you go. Um... Is is Pep Guardiola as sensitive a soul as he comes across when so I'm sure I'm sure in the press conference he was funny and engaging and I'm I'm like I'm I'm the one of the greatest football managers of all time and you guys who are asking me these questions about my tactics in the Champions League over the last number of years. Well, you're not. I am, you're not. And it, I'm sure he was able to carry that off. In print, reading his comments today, he seems a little bit touchy. He seems a little bit but- which, which ones, Chair? Which comments particularly? Oh, I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play. My, I'm gonna play twelfth man tomorrow. I, my tactics are crazy. Ha ha. I'm. I. I. You know. Uh... I suppose that was a partial reference to Bayern Munich doing that against Freiburg, wasn't it? And I, <laughs> and I think that's why I wanted to hone into your. Uh, you, you know, if we go microscopic on this, you're talking about like, yeah, I overthink it. That's why I've won so much. That, that's that's the one, isn't it? Yes. First of all, I think I think you know we have truisms or cliches in life that we use um, because they're true. Give a dog a bad name. So if if somebody is is branding you or Owen incorrectly, what are you going to do? Give them a big slobbering kiss, accept it, or come out with a bottle of Bucky in your hand fighting? It's going to be the latter, isn't it? Um, If if we're being honest, and I, I, you know, the tone of your show is always a little bit, you know, let's get beyond just the front, you know, provocative nature of the question. Um, if Guardiola was constantly prone for overthinking things, then he, he wouldn't be where he is, he wouldn't be paid what he is, he wouldn't have won what he's won. I think there are a couple of occasions where he's been obstinate about, first of all, the over-analysis, the super-analysis is what made him. Um, he had a clear brain about how he wanted football to be played from the moment he was boss of the midfield in the dream team through um, going to Italy specifically and he chose uh, Roma because he wanted to learn how to defend from Capello as his coach and then from the days forward at Barca B where he insisted insisted that they spend money that the bosses at, at Barcelona B were arguing they didn't have on, on the scouts for his team all being able to film opponents' matches full pitch, not, you know, follow the ball. That was technology, which is relatively common in TV studios now, or relatively common, but in 2008, it wasn't go onwards. If you if you talk about the way in which his um, video analysts gave him package after package after package as the Barcelona manager at Lundtreble in his first season, 
he would analyze and analyze in a deep subterranean room in the camp now, no natural light, no windows, a couple of photos of his family, and he'd be there for hours going, how do I unpick? Now, across his career, that level of analysis has both led him to undo opponents and it's led him to invent new things in his own teams, not just City, that rivals find uh, hard to cope with. I, so the overthinking thing as a generic. When the first time I heard Tuchel talking about um, Pep Guardiola was in a conference, an Aspire conference in Berlin when I was there, interviewed Arne Cruyff, and, and Tuchel gave a, a, in English, um, um, not a masterclass, but a, a tutorial for about, 60 or 70 clubs that were gathered there from around the world together under the auspices of Aspire. And the, in the previous seven or 10 days, his Dortmund had played by a minute. And he said, one of the worst things about it isn't the, the budget difference, isn't the quality difference. It's that you come up with an idea of how you want to play against Pets Bayern. You imagine how Pets Bayern will play against you and they might start off the same way. But he said, they'll change four times tactically within a match. And you're struggling to keep up and you're wasting valuable time when you should be paying attention to your own team when you're working out what has he done, how do I combat it? He said, it's hell. Now, one of the instances where, I don't know, I, if you want to argue that Pep is sensitive to the, you know, the, the bulls thing of, of this overthinking, then then fine. I, I don't want to go out and bat for him. He's perfectly capable of doing it. So, but analytically, I think that some of the lazy uh, work in England that is that is based around that accusation can be attributed to the biggest defeat that Tuchel gave Guardiola, which is last season's Champions League, where the way in which he, he configured the midfield seemed to not be in tune with what City needed to do. Ultimately, they lost. But there's a world-class, I think, Rudiger tackle in the penalty box that prevents a goal. There's a brutal foul in De Bruyne that robs it, blah, 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 blah. So you won't get me jumping in to go, poor old pet, leave him alone, which I don't really think was your purpose. But I do think that the, the, the phrase, I mean, listen, heaven forbid I ever fulfill one of my little dreams about like, suddenly somebody tapped me on the shoulder and say, you take over Aberdeen, or you take over, hey, Manchester City, fine. I'd be off the podium and into the press conference dealing out, you know, hooks <laughs> with the way that we as an industry sometimes treat players and coaches. So I think he was quite restrained, Jar. How about that for the morning? Well, there you go. Um, is, there, is there a pattern that has prevented him from reaching the full potential of the teams over that period of time? Is that is there is there anything in... like? It feels like there have been times when he's had the best team and they haven't won the competition. And that's football, and I totally understand that. It's just that it has happened after some of those decisions. Like, I, I, I get the point you're making about that, that game. There are other games over the years where... The only other game that's a big stain that backs your argument is the one where he's um, played Real Madrid as Bayern Munich coach and they've lost narrowly 1-0 in the Bernabeu. And he admits, and admitted very promptly after the thrashing they took at hands of Gareth Bale and Sergio Ramos in Bavaria, that the players had come to him and said, we think we should play this way. This is how we want to play. And he acceded. That wasn't overthinking. It wasn't his decision. And he blamed himself, not the players. He blamed himself for acceding. They were thrashed at home um, by Real Madrid. Didn't cope tactically in any way whatsoever. And I would say that's the only other time when you could say, uh, look, Pep, the reality of what you did on the night didn't correspond to the way the analysis should have told you to approach the tie based on your opponent's previous form and the last leg of the, of the, of the tie. And I, I don't buy that his um, career is littered with instances where it looks like he's overdone things. And you... You, above all, whether you like his style, whether you like him or not, and what you said, your dark comment, is something that's echoed to me by people who have to interview him post-match all the time. They think that he is ultra-touchy, that he deliberately pretends not to understand, that he'll cough in the middle of a question. or They think that it's a minefield talking to him. 
which is embarrassing for him because he's the only manager who, in the red mist of a post-match, sometimes loses his temper a little bit. It literally has never been heard of before, <laughs> ever. No, fair enough. Not by I, Red, I, not, I, not I, by Ferguson. Klopp, Klopp, you, Klopp's I, terrible I here. Um, but this is, this is pre-match, I suppose. That's what that's what makes this interesting. Um, is he spooked at all by by? I think he'd like better quality of questions, Joe. And is that too much to ask? I mean, you should know at this stage. He's been around the game long enough. That ain't going to happen. I, I go back to my point about give a dog a bad name. I, I am. You are asking somebody who, um, although I know him, I've met him socially. I've interviewed him many times. I've had the fortune to watch his teams and try and report well on them. But you know, I'm not going to go out on the super defensive for him as a person. But I do tell you seriously. I watch our profession, I watch those circumstances, and I often wonder why managers don't completely lose their shit all the time and, and call out journalists who they think are duds. And, you know, if you're working at an elite level, genuinely an elite level, I don't think anybody would argue that Guardiola has done things with the sport we love that has changed our vista, that has entertained us, that sometimes has left us in shock and awe. Maybe Wembley at 2011 is the is the hyper example. If you're if you're surrounded by nitwits all the time, you're going to call them out occasionally. You you don't think that's fair? No, I do, I do. I think that um, calling out nitwits is great, and it was it will make for a great copy as well. I I just it yeah. does it does feel like he he's got a big itch that he needs to scratch with this Manchester City team, and and. Um, they need to win a Champions League for him to, for I would say, for him to consider his period there truly successful by his own I think standards. that's right. I think that's right. And look, before the final last season, I interviewed him and he talked, and I believe it, and listen, no, I'll tell you first, the Gerstein with whom he, he played for a chunk of time in the Dream Team and, and won the Champions League at Wembley in 92, the Gerstein, who was his director of football at Barcelona and is and has helped him hand in hand construct the type of team he wants to City. I interviewed him during one of the last two seasons um, in their first knockout draw. Uh, this is Bukharistan. And I said, listen, that was quite a tough group. You came through, well done, it's an achievement. He said, he said stop right there. He said, thank you. Thank you that somebody acknowledged that irrespective of who we are, how we play, coming through the group, we consider an achievement. It's hard work. It's much harder than people. And I know that like when they went into, went to Portugal this season, and was it Sporting, I think, they, they pumped in the first mm. leg? Am I right? Yeah. Um, Pep came out and said, you know, the, the, the final score doesn't reflect the opponent or how difficult they are, etc. And then second leg, kind of supporting his idea. People laugh at Chiqui Bagherstein or Pep Guardiola when they call certain ties, certain tasks difficult. People do not believe them. Because when they cut loose, they're awesome. They, they're capable of running up fives and sixes and sevens and eights. And they have been one of the great teams of the Premier era, one of them. So all I would say to you is that if Pep were answering your original question about the Champions League and the need to win it, I think that's true. I think anybody who denied it would deny the personality of Guardiola, which is excellent, which is win everything all the time. But I also buy in his his argument that it, it isn't always the best team that wins. I do buy into his argument that, that minor deep what did Pep have to do with Llorente handling the ball in the Spurs game and that goal knocking them out? What, what, what responsibility did Pep have for that? Zero. What responsibility did Pep have for the, I think, De Bruyne free kick in Paris when they're knocking out PSG on the route to the final, where it's deflected and it goes in at a time where Paris Saint-Germain were really all over City? Nothing. His argument that this is a competition of tiny infinitesimal details on top of how well you're build your squad, how well you pick your team, how much what form you're in, how injuries and suspensions affect you. There's really palpable evidence, including the ones I gave you about the final, where what influence does Pep have in that outstanding Rudiger tackle? I think on Foden in the penalty box when he's about to score, what influence does Pep Guardiola have on the way in which De Bruyne is concussed out of the game with a with a you know a squashed tomato face? None. These details genuinely do count. He's not telling a lie. But your, your proposal is right. He, he lives to win. The Champions League is one of those trophies that he yearns for. Until he does that, he'll be undersatisfied. He'll only have done a 96% out of 100 job, which is, you know, I know you're not saying that's awful, but that's what I'm saying he's done so far. It's interesting that if you look at 
the manager in the opposite uh, technical area tonight, Graham, and uh, across these two legs, and uh, Simeone, who you would, or not you, who one might rush to say that uh, is tactically on the opposite end of the scale to Pep Guardiola. But the more you read about them, the more you listen to them speak about one another, especially from Pep Guardiola's side, it's just not adoration, but it's respect for one another, the, the, the sort of uh, love for resistance that Atletico Madrid have brought over the last couple of years. That's something in particular that, that Pep Guardiola deeply admires. I agree with you. Remember, they played against each other. Um... <laughs> Excuse me, and as such, um, learned respect then. Um, there's also no question whatsoever that Pep Guardiola has a massive respect for the, the, the whether it's innate or learned concepts of Argentinian football. He loves the competitor, he loves the person that's never beaten. Yeah, he loves the man with boots and a computer brain too. <laughs> you know, I won't deny that. But, uh, you know, when Cholo Simeone last knocked Pep Guardiola, and I'm not predicting that Letty do that this time, in the Champions League, the semi-final of 2016. There were two extraordinary matches, genuinely extraordinary matches, where, again, tiny details, a missed penalty, uh, I think by Muller, uh, led to Bayern, only winning 2-1 at home when Griezmann scored. So Cholo, uh, Cholo Simeone has inflicted really, really painful um, defeat on Pep Guardiola, who at Bayern was... was um, you know, one goal away from a final in Milan against Real Madrid. How enticing would that have been? Ultimately, it was a, it was a beautiful final, and Madrid won again. Cholo Simeone's ideas are the antithesis of Pep. You're right. It's not that Atleti are uncoached, but they're coached in a very um, monochrome way. It is it is only about winning. Cholo Simeone doesn't care about how beautiful it is. He doesn't care about whether they're sterile or whether they score five. He doesn't care. He only cares about winning. Now, that's a link to Guardiola, who, who really only cares about winning two. People forget that. He says it. And people ignore it. He thinks that attack is... Guardiola, is, attack is the best means of defence. Cholo Simeone thinks that defending is the best means of defence. Um, Pep Guardiola thinks that possession of the ball, domination of possession, gives you a far high percentage chance, chance of winning or not losing, irrespective of the nuances there of how you use the possession to win. Cholo Simeone renounces possession. He doesn't think it's all that important. They are antithesis in terms of um, how they believe they can get to the finishing tape, but both of them are obsessed by identical things. And... Jer's point on was about, without using the word obsessed, because Pep would probably hear it and nick across to Dublin, um, Joe Simeone's a, a more obsessed probably about winning this Champions League. He's haunted by it. He's a superstitious man. He talked about, I mean, if, if, if the final in Lisbon where you're winning 1-0 into the 91st minute and Sergio Ramos scores into half a postage stamp um, against Courtois, for heaven's sake, and then you come back and you play the same rival in Milan two years later and there's an offside goal for Real Madrid and it goes to penalties and Juan from misses the only one and the players that can barely walk for Real Madrid um, score their penalties nonetheless. And you talk afterwards about being haunted by hearing the, the Champions League anthem. Haunted. That's his word. This is a competition that totally, totally obsesses Cholo Simeone too. You're not predicting they're going to knock them out, though. Over the, you think City are going to do it over the two legs? Uh, I, I think logic tells you to to favour the the side with the the more solutions, the deeper squad, the better form, uh, and and that concede fewer goals. That makes sense. In in my opinion, that in my opinion, yeah. That then that comes to the argument: Would I discount Atleti? I'd almost say never, almost, and it's true that while, um, I mean, the big thing in this game is when Jimenez and Savic play together for Atleti, there's like a, a, an enormous, an inordinate leap in the number of games they draw or win. Jimenez is out tonight. That's verging on disastrous for Atleti. It doesn't guarantee defeat, but it strips massive percentage points away from the likelihood of them defending successfully. And I'll throw in a little, can you believe that tonight on the pitch, Oblak and Ederson will be reunited, having been competing goalkeepers at Rio Ave in the squad for Nuno Espirito Santo and Ian Catro. Ederson was kept on the bench by Oblak. And Benfica signed Oblak because he's the better one. And then he moves on to Atleti. And to replace Oblak, Benfica signed Ederson. And here they are again tonight. It's extraordinary. Oblak 
They're the, they're the same age bar, six months, the same height, the same weight. And All Black at Rio Ave, in Portuguese football, in fact, was the fancy keeper. And for a long time, not with his feet, but on save percentage and, and lack of error percentage, All Black was the best goalkeeper in the world. This season, he's been flawed. And Ederson is on much better form than him. And, and therefore, that's although in recent weeks, All Black has improved, he has not been hitting his own standards. Those little things against the City side, which possibly you didn't play as the false nine, Foden, Maris, Silva. I don't really know. Probably Foden. They're gonna they're gonna tempt that Letty's back four, back five. There'll be a three plus two wing backs. Probably Rente going back to right wing back from attacking midfield, which strips another goal opportunity away from them. I think it'll be an interesting time. I think it'll be much much harder um, for Atleti, who narrowly squeaked by United. And therefore, over the two legs, I, I'd be a liar if I said I didn't think that City have the capacity to do it. Um, is there a, a realistic possibility that Benfica can knock Liverpool out over two legs? I don't think so. If you look at the Champions League group, I watch them a lot. Um, they're competent. Um, they're, they're tail end Charlies in the, three, the traditional three horse race for the Portuguese title. In Darwin Nunez, they've got a striker that everybody wants that Spurs nearly signed. Um, David Pleat phoned me about him, asked me about him when he was playing second division football in Spain. Spurs were on the point of pressing the button. He looked as if he was slightly too green and needed another couple of seasons. Those couple of seasons have made him a hot, hot property. Very interesting guy. Benfica are not mugs. But if Liverpool hit something around 85, 90% of normal form and intensity, then they can expect to go through. An easy tie in Portugal, I wouldn't put it down as that. But yeah, over the two legs, Liverpool, yes. Graham, enjoy it. Thanks a million. Cheers. I will do.